Good afternoon. Welcome to our after afternoon colloquium. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Michael Gem from EC Department at Duke University. He probably doesn't need an introduction. He was our former colleague at University of Arizona until Duke stole us, uh, stole him away from us. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> he uh, received his PhD degree in physics from Duke University uh, on the topic of experimental studies of degenerate Fermi <coughs> gases. And from there on, his interest turned to computational sensing. And after a postdoc in the field, uh, he joined us at University of Arizona, rising to the uh, level of associate professor before his move to Duke University in 2013. His primary research interests are in computational sensing with specific applications in optics, X-ray, mass spectrometry, and additional interest in fundamental optical physics and development of 3D printer technologies to directly fabricate functional electromagnetic components. So with that introduction, I'll invite uh, Dr. Michael Gem to present on adaptive architectures for spectral processing. Thank you. Thanks, Amit. Thanks so much. And thanks to the organizers for inviting me. Um, when I put this first slide together, I, I didn't know how well it was going to mesh with, um, with the introduction. Um, so, so my group uh, at Duke is the Lab for Engineering Non-Traditional Sensors, LENS. Um, we are a, a computational sensing group. Um, can we drop the, is there a way to drop the lights a little bit? Or is, or, or is that already all the way down? Maybe that may be all the way down. Okay. All right. Anyway, um, uh, and so computational sensing group, and I work in a bunch of different modalities, not all optical. Um, so, you know, as I was looking back over some of the stuff that we've done over the last four or five years, um, take a minute to just talk briefly about that. Uh, you may have seen David Brady's, uh, uh, or even heard his colloquium uh, on his uh, gigapixel uh, imagers. Uh, our group led the effort to combine the data from all of those uh, myriad micro cameras and combine them into a seamless whole. So we, did, we worked on that for a number of years. Uh, have been doing for a number of years work on building computational mass spectrometers where we introduce coding concepts to allow us to shrink the spectrometer without uh, uh, paying a penalty in resolution while uh, increasing the throughput. And just recently, we've, we've started a project with RPE where we then take these, mo uh, these miniaturized mass spectrometers and we use compressive sensing ideas to help us detect uh, and estimate leaks of methane based on how the, the concentration of methane is diffusing through the atmosphere given knowledge of, of uh, what wind has transpired. Uh, and the goal there is, is to achieve a 90% reduction in the level of, of uh, leaked methane uh, for greenhouse gas mitigation. Um, I have a long-standing collaboration with members here uh, uh, with DHS, and we've, we've developed tools for very, very rapid uh, X-ray physics simulation uh, for security screening. Um, for a number of years, I've been working in the area of using 3D printers to directly fabricate electromagnetic components. Basically, we can use the different 3D printing materials to give us control over epsilon and mu in a volume, so we can do things like print uh, uh, low-loss waveguides and uh, various gradient index lenses and even volume uh, volume holograms uh, directly on the 3D printer. Uh, and we've just started an effort with DARPA uh, designed to allow estimation of complex 3D scenes, but collecting light only from one location. So you're making use of light reflecting off walls to get, for example, pictures of the backs of your heads. Right? The goal would be able to reconstruct the full three-dimensional view of this room, collecting light just from this scene. Uh, and so our team works on uh, using something called memory effect, uh, which is a way of being able to image through highly scattering media, and that's just been starting. But one thing that's been sort of a consistent theme since I started at University of Arizona in 2007, and which is the topic for today's talk, is looking at adaptive spectral processing architectures. And so that's going to be the, the, the topic of, of the colloquium today. Um, and so that brings us to this slide. So uh, as Ahmed said, adaptive architectures for spectral processing. Um, the, the work that I'm going to be talking about uh, has been funded in the past, uh, various projects, uh, both by DARPA and various TRIF funding and stuff like that from when I was here at Arizona. Uh, and I'd like to start by acknowledging the senior staff in my group that's worked on this over the years, as well as uh, the students uh, uh, over the years that have worked in these various areas. Okay, so computational sensing, I probably don't need to say too much since Arizona is one of the places where this sort of way of thinking uh, evolved, but, but a brief introduction, right? I, I think we might all agree that the goal of, of sensor design is to maximize sensor performance while minimizing the resources that you use. 
resources loosely defined, uh, uh, you know, whatever is constraining you. Uh, but we, there's been an interesting fact that in the past 50 years, there's really been a transformative change in the resources that are available, uh, especially in, in optical sensing. And so if we sort of look along three axes, processing, detection, and storage, you know, in the 17th century, if, if you were doing, say, imaging, you know, the processing was done with the brain, detection was the human eye, and if you wanted to store the image, you would get out the easel and you'd start sketching. Um, in, the, in the 19th century, with the invention of photography, we have a, a chemical medium that now acts as both a detection and a storage medium. But the, the key point is that, you know, starting with World War II, all of a sudden we developed electronic versions of all these that have just, while year by year it's a quantitative change, overall it's become a qualitative change in the resource environment. But as you're aware, you know, imager, spectrometer, most of the sensor architectures that we deal with were invented for this resource environment, right? They, they, they make pretty pictures that you can interpret with your brain, or they disperse stuff out linearly uh, on one axis so you can interpret the spectrum, uh, and we can do different things. And so computational sensing is all about this idea of thinking of the sensor as an inverse problem, and an inverse problem that we can structure to make it more robust or more powerful by designing the nature of the physical measurement. So when I talk about adaptive spectral processing, what we're going to be talking about today is rather than using a traditional spectrometer of whatever type to capture the spectrum and then do some type of post-processing afterwards to do exploitation, whether it's classification or detection or what have you, um, what if we instead think about designing the optical instrument to do this exploitation task directly? And further, if we're going to be designing the measurement, being able to design the measurement for it to, to have some type of optimal performance means we can continue to do it over and over again, and we can make the system adaptive as well. And what we've seen in, in my group over the years is that whenever we do this, we see multiple order of magnitude gains in performance. Okay. So the very first thing we tried uh, when, I, when I got to Arizona in, in 2007, uh, I, I needed a toy problem. I, I knew I wanted to work in this adaptive spectroscopy area, um, but I'd never worked with spatial light modulators before. I was cheap, right? I, I you know, had my startup money. I didn't want to spend a lot of it. So you know, I was going to rip the DMDs out of projectors. And so we needed a toy problem to sort of learn uh, you know, how to work with these as components. And so what we came up with was this idea of dynamic range matching spectroscopy. And this was about the time that a lot of HDR imaging, high dynamic range imaging concepts were, were coming into existence. This idea of taking uh, exposure bracketing, exposure stacks, and being able to synthesize them into a particular image that had very high dynamic range, greater dynamic range than the sensor itself. Uh, and what we wanted to do was to do that, though not to make a pretty picture, but to find a way to do it quantitatively that allowed us to get quantitative spectra where when the source dynamic range was greater than the dynamic range of the sensor. And so, you know, not very difficult. We, you know, we have an incoming uh, light through an entrance aperture off a reflection grating, and then we could just turn spectral channels on and off with our micromirror array and decide whether or not they got relayed onto the detector. And so when we were faced with a very bright channel, after accumulating enough information about it, we could turn it off so that it didn't saturate the detector, didn't contaminate nearby, cha uh, nearby spectral channels. And in the end, I, I won't go into the details, but what we found was that we could achieve with a $100 webcam, and, and that was in 2007, so that's like a $5 webcam today, right? That we could get dynamic range performance in our measurements equivalent to a, like a $25,000 scientific camera. And, and we could just, I given I equivalent imaging time, right? And so we would just learn enough about the bright features, and then we could turn them off, continuing to uh, learn more about the weak features and letting them come up out of, out of the noise floor. And so what you see here on top, they've, they've been separated just so you, or, or no, actually they haven't. The top is, is measured with a, a traditional sort of instrument using the webcam, and, and we pick out these, these major spe uh, spikes, but there's this noise floor, and there's all these weak peaks that live below the noise floor, and you really can't pick them out of sort of just the noise that's living there. But with the adaptive system, we all of a sudden resolve all these other peaks. And this is, this is a, a neon discharge lamp, and these lines are the known discharge lines in, in neon in that range. And so you see we, we end up being able to resolve most of them, again, with sort of a toy, uh, to toy, toy detector array, and instead moving the cost of the detector into the micromere array. And this turns out to be sort of uh, maybe one of the initial or, or, or one of the, the main... Uh, 
uh, storylines of this is that um, high performance detectors are very expensive. They're made in very limited quantities. Mirror rays, at least at this time, lived in pretty, pretty much every high definition television set and projector that, that, that existed. And so the economies of scale were dramatically different. And so we could put the mod, it was very cost effective to put the, mod, the modulation and control in this cheap uh, component that was being made on commercial scales rather in scientific grade scales uh, in the detector. Okay. So, so we learned a little bit from that about how to use these components. And so having had some confidence, we wanted to turn to something maybe a little more meaningful. And this is the idea of spectral classification. So um, you know, perhaps in contrast to imaging, when you do spectroscopy, you're almost never doing it because you actually care about the spectrum. There, there are certainly exceptions. But you know, people used to have we used to have drawers full of, of photographs. Now we have hard drives full of photographs. Very few people keep pretty spectra, right? But we keep pretty pictures. So did, almost always you're doing it because you're going to do detection or classification or some other exploitation task. And classification is a particularly common one. And, you know, sort of at the high level, we can just think of classification as I have a list, I have a library of things, and I get a measurement, and I want to match it and I want to know which one of these things is it like, okay? And so that's the task that we're going to start looking at. Can we build an instrument that's doing that directly? Okay, so more about sp spectral classification. So, so here I've just taken those three uh, spectra in the library. I've, I've put them here, and then I've superposed the, the, the actual measurement there. And uh, I can think of it this way, or I can think of these as vectors in some high-dimensional space, right? So I can think of my library as three vectors living in some high-dimensional spectral space. Now, when I make a measurement of any one of those, measurement invariably includes noise, so I wouldn't get exactly one of those spectra. I can think of them as, as sort of having little noise balls that live at the end of them, right? And my measurement would ultimately live somewhere in, in, in the, the corresponding noise ball. Now, this problem is very easy. The, 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 the fuzzy black line that's the real measurement is basically right on top of the green one. There's no possibility that it's really, it's the blue one or the red one. And that would be equivalent to getting a measurement that lives you know, somewhere very clearly in this, in this green noise ball. And at that point, classification is very easy. But if my noise is larger, now the noise balls start to overlap. And I have this possibility, illustrated here, that I might get a measurement that becomes ambiguous, right? What, what happens if when I, in, in this high dimensional vector space, what if my measurement lives in this overlap region? It starts to become harder to say something. And then of course I can continue to blow those up until the, the, the balls are, are, you know, the, the vectors themselves are negligible compared to the size of the ball and it's pretty much all an ambiguous reason, region. So the, the story here, first of all, is that when we're talking about how difficult classification is, SNR, conventional SNR is not the relevant measure. Whenever you think about it, you end up getting something that looks like this. People have defined different things. This is what we call task SNR. And so it, it's an SNR-like variable, right? We have a signal type quantity and we have a noise type quantity and we take their ratio and we can talk about them in decibels. But here, it, this is the minimum, minimum Euclidean distance between the signals in our library. Basically, it's, it's this distance here. And so we would say a classification task is easy. We have a high task SNR when this separation is large compared to the size of this ball, right? And when the separation starts to become comparable to the size of the ball, then classification becomes difficult. And then here, the size of the ball dwarfs the separation, OK? Um, and so on this scale, these are, the these are the corresponding numbers for these definitions. So this would be a 25 dB task SNR down to a minus 25 dB ta task SNR. Now, this classification task is easy, OK? We, we could train a presidential candidate to do this one. Um, you know, what I'm going to be, sh what we care about, the problems that are hard live in this space, okay? And everything I'm going to show you is going to live from zero dB and lower. So we're going to be considering only cases where the noise is as large or larger than the separation of the things in our library, okay? And those are the problems that we ultimately care about. Okay, so, so that's how we categorize classification difficulty. We're going to make measurements. Now, in any measurement, any linear measurement we make ends up being equivalent to making a projection. So here, 
ignore the text for a moment. So I, I'm showing two spectra living in my high dimensional spectral space. And I'm, I'm going to want to tell them apart. Okay. Now, if I was going to measure them with a conventional instrument, the projections I would make is I would see how much power there was in each spectral channel. Right? It's a cartoon. I only have two dimensions. So one spectral channel runs this way, and one spectral channel runs this way. Right? And so I would measure that like this. I would, with a traditional instrument, I would see how much power of the green signal lives in this dimension, and how much lives in this dimension, and the same with the red. Now, again, I won't get the exact answer. It'll be corrupted by noise. So this projection, right? The ideal value would be here, but I would get something that lives somewhere in this in this equivalent of this noise ball. Okay, and so I could do that for for the green and, or the red or whatever vector I have. Now it turns out that if you're trying to tell the difference between two things, the ideal projection to make is actually along their difference. Okay, so if I project this green vector onto this black line, I would get a measurement here. And if I projected the red vector onto this line, I would get a, a measurement here. And this is the maximum separation I can get with that projection. So it's the optimal thing that, that, uh, that I could choose to do if I wanted to, 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 uh, to tell those two apart. Okay? But remember, I didn't measure that. I measured the projections onto these spectral channels. And so if I wanted to do this in post-processing, what I would basically do is I would try and estimate where I would have fallen had I made this projection along this black line. But now I have to combine these two things, or n things with n spectral channels, each of which has its own noise contribution. And so the net result is that there's a noise penalty. The uncertainty here is bigger than it was on any one of those individual channels. And same thing here. So I've maximized the separation. But remember, the thing that describes classification difficulty is separation divided by the size of the noise ball. So I, I've made my job harder in some sense than it needs to be by doing it in post-processing because I've reduced that ratio because I've increased the denominator. If instead I can make my optical system do the ideal projection, then I maintain this maximum separation, but this uncertainty here is now just what I get from a single noise hit. I don't have all these multiple noise hits, each associated with a spectral channel, which I then have to combine together. Okay? And it's even better than that because when I'm making the projection optically, I actually am not limited to projecting onto a vector of length 1. The maximum vector I can project onto would be the vector which accepted all the light in all n dimensions. And that vector would be like, look like a, a vector of all 1s. And that would have length square root of n. So I have some chance to actually amplify the separation. So if I, if I have the ability to project into a direction which has a norm longer than 1, I can actually increase the separation while keeping the noise bubble size constant. Okay? So that's where the win comes in from being able to do these projections optically. Now, if I project in the wrong direction, I pay a separation penalty. I can bring those points closer together. Right? reducing this fraction of separation over noise. All right? And so the upshot is I'm going to make what we're going to call features. That's these optical projections. Okay? But designing them is critical. So some of you may have seen or heard about compressive sensing things where they make a bunch of random projections. Okay? This shows you why you're paying a penalty by using random instead of design projections. Because the designed one can identify the proper direction that maximizes separation, minimizes noise, but if you're just doing things randomly, you don't get that optimal behavior. And so you don't, you don't get the optimal combination of separation and noise. OK. So classification difficulty we can describe by this ratio. We're going to measure things by making optical projections. And we'll see how that works in a minute. Um, and we're going to make, those, we're gonna make do those projections optically. But how do we design them? How do we choose the one I want? Well, in the case I just showed you, there were two vectors, and I was trying to tell them apart. The optimal answer is known when you're trying to tell two things apart. There is no optimal answer when you're trying to tell n things apart. So when I'm trying to classify a variety of things, what do I do? So what does it even mean to maximize separation among more than two things? Does it mean get the biggest separation between any two? Does it mean get the biggest average separation? What, what's the right metric of separation? Well, one ad hoc thing we can do is think about principal component analysis. So again, here we have another cartoon. 
Each dot is meant to represent a compound, a spectrum in my library, a thing I'm potentially trying to classify and decide between. Well, if you remember your principal component analysis, the first principal component lies in the direction of the longest spread of the cloud of points that you have. It's the direction into which ha where your data has the biggest variance. So projecting in that projecting onto a vector lying in that direction maximizes the variance of the resulting values you get. And so that's maybe not a bad thing to use as maximizing their separation, right? maximizing their overall variance. So we could imagine taking the first principal component of our library and saying, OK, I want to project onto that. And that's going to do a pretty good job of separating things. It's not a bad choice of projection vector. But now, as I measure, I'm going to learn stuff. And so I don't want to keep measuring the same thing over and over again. And so this idea is, well, when I, when I make a measurement, right, I've learned stuff. Maybe, right, maybe now, after my first measurement, some number of the elements in the library still have a high probability of being true. They're the ones that were pretty consistent with the first measurement I got. Whereas a bunch of other ones, the ones represented by the lighter dots, maybe that, you know, they weren't very consistent with that first measurement. So I can design things through what we call probabilistic PCA, where we fold in these, prob these Bayesian probability estimates, the probability of compound B being the true compound given all the measurements I've made. So without this, okay, this is just the covariance matrix. Okay? So if I just hit my library, this is the spectrum of compound B. This is the average spectrum. Right? That summed over everything would be the covariance matrix. And the first eigenvector of the covariance matrix is the first principal component. But now, if we weight things so that we fold in the probability of the different compounds given all the measurements we've got, and we have to adjust our definition of what the mean is as well by folding those probabilities in, then what happens is the principal component rotates. Right? And so now, instead of this original one, now that these are the ones that are in strong contention, we end up getting a direction that works well to separate those. It maximizes the variance of the, the ones that are sort of remaining in contention. And so now we have an adaptivity framework. Right? After each measurement, we'll use Bayes' rule, basically, to update the probability, a probability estimate for each thing in the library. And then we can design a new feature vector to use to try and better separate the things that we're still trying to decide between. OK, so how are we going to do this in hardware? All right, so cartoon of a basic dispersive spectrometer. So light comes in, hits the dispersive element, we get a spectrum, and it falls on a detector array. All we're going to do for this first thing is we're going to replace the detector array with a DMD. And we have the ability to turn specific spectral channels off. And all of that light then gets condensed onto a single photo detector. So this is the spectral equivalent of the single pixel camera. And so what this does physically is it implements the inner product between whatever spectrum we have here and whatever filter pattern we have here. The value of this photo detector is proportional to that inner product. Okay. And so that, and that's a projection. An inner product is a projection. So we've made, we, we've made that feature. We've, we've measured that feature. And so we built this. We ripped uh, DMD out of a Pico projector. Um, and you know, we, we could get fancy using grayscale modulation to, to give us grayscale, or, or temporal modulation to give us grayscale features. Didn't worry about that. We could have gotten fancy, done different things in different rows. Didn't worry about that. In the initial setup, we had 160 independent spectral channels. And so there you see the CAD, and there's the rendering of the system. Light comes in, hits the DMD, and then goes up to single pixel detector. And what we observed was that uh, we got f to, a, uh, to an answer, to a classification, 15 times faster than the conventional approach. And further exploration through simulation showed us that the, actually the, the improvement was proportional to the number of spectral channels we had. So the more high resolution things were, the faster we could come to a decision. Not, maybe not surprising. So this is actual experimental results. So, so here we're running a five class problem. That is, our library has five different compounds in it. But it's, what the curves are actually many different Monte Carlo runs, different libraries that we've experimentally generated, and many instantiations of noise and, and all that. And we average over all that. Now, 
at the time of this experiment, what we were doing was we were doing a uh, sequential hypothesis testing approach. That is, the system ran until it had achieved a certain level of confidence. Here we're running until we reach what we believe is a 1% false alarm or false positive rate, so classification error. This is the average time to classification as a function of this task SNR, how hard the classification is. Okay, And you see the time goes up as the problem gets more and more difficult. The red is what we get when we run it, the system as a traditional instrument. We measure, and then we do classification. The blue is our simulation of the instrument, and the pink are the experimental results. And so they match, match very well. And then this gap down here is a factor of about 15x. And again, as I said, what we found later on is that depending on how many spectral channels you had, this could become much larger. And in other problems, we, we saw it up to 1,500 times uh, faster. Okay? Now, you may be wondering what's going on down here. Why are we doing worse than the conventional instrument? Well, the, the features we get, the principal components, they're not, they don't come out just positive or non-negative. Okay? They, they're bipolar. Um, and we decided to deal with that by measuring the positive piece one time and then the negative piece and then synthesizing the projection we would have gotten had we been able to apply positive and negative weightings. Okay? Um, and so what that means is in very simple problems where the conventional instrument only takes one measurement, right? Um, we take two because we're measuring the positive and the negative piece. But it's so easy, we probably could have just measured either the positive piece or the negative piece and come up with the answer. So that's really just an artifact of how we decided to implement that. Uh, and again, like I said, the piece, you know, the, the problems people are interested in solving are the ones that live down here where classification is hard. Okay. So, okay, so that's direct classification in spectroscopy. Our next step was spectral imaging. So you're probably aware, spectral imager, you get spectral information not at a single location, but at every point in a scene. Okay? And so, so you know, one-dimensional spectrum, three-dimensional spectral data cube. You get much greater data dimensionality. Now, I just showed you a system that um, could do classification, spectral classification, at a point. So, we could imagine solving this problem by building a parallel array of those systems. But that would require a DMD for each location, right? That would make DMD manufacturers very happy, but it would make us and our customers very sad. So, so that's not a good approach. So we need a different uh, architecture. And, and again, just to remind, just to give you some idea of the numbers, right? Whereas spe Spectra might have hundreds of channels, thousands of channels, you know, uh, when, you, when you're talking real world spectral imaging, you're probably talking hundreds of thousands to billions of elements uh, in this cube. It's a very, very high dimensional problem. All right, so how do we, how do we decide to solve it? Um, we, we built a system that looks like this, and I'll, I'll walk through what, what, what's going on in a minute, but it's, it's two 4F arms, each with a dispersive element in it, uh, and the dispersions are equal but opposite, okay, in the, in the two arms. Now, this is a dynamic version of a system that I built back as a postdoc. There it was static, and it was the first compressive spectral imager uh, uh, that, that had been constructed, and we realized that it was doing almost exactly what we wanted, except that we wanted to make it adaptive. So instead of a static mask, uh, we put a dynamic um, a DMD, a, a dynamic mirror device in there. All right, so how does this work? So we can follow what goes on by thinking about the spectral data cube. So remember, I have spectral data cube, I have two spatial dimensions. At each spatial location, I have a spectrum, okay? So I have an input spectral data cube. This is, you know, sort of the thing that spectral imagers are designed to measure. At the input plane of the instrument, that's what, uh, what I have. When I hit the first dispersive element, I, I get dispersion, okay? And I can think of that dispersion as a shear of the cube, okay? The longer wavelengths, the reds, right, shift in the direction of dispersion, and they shift more than the blues, okay? And so that, it's like grabbing the top of that cube and pulling it sideways, okay? Then I hit the DMD. Now, the DMD has a mirror pattern on it, and I can choose with each mirror whether the light at that location proceeds to the second half of the system or whether it's shunted to a beam dump. So that's equivalent to punching an X and Y pattern vertically through this sheared cube and carving out pieces of it. Okay? So part, portions of that cube now just go away. Those are the mirrors that divert the, that corresponding light and all the wavelengths that are present to a beam dump. 
Then I hit the second disperser, equal dispersion, opposite direction, and I rectify the cube now. It's not sheared anymore, but now what were vertical tunnels carved through that sheared cube become these diagonal tunnels carved through the rectified cube, right? And then I hit the detector array, and that integrates over wavelength. So if I think about what's happened, say, at this pixel, I had a spectrum in the spectral data cube, but I, and, but I only kept certain portions of it, and I added it together, and that's an inner product. So each pixel is measuring the inner product of the spectrum that was there with the particular on and off pattern that was carved into the cube by the mirror pattern, okay? And so I've, I've implemented uh, these different spectral filters on all these different locations, but instead of needing N DMDs, I'm using one, okay? So this, this seems to solve uh, that problem. But if you're paying careful attention, you see that things have gotten a little complicated. Uh, the, the filters aren't unrelated. Well, within, within a particular Y value, so within a particular row, they, they have this diagonal structure. With respect to the next row, they're completely independent. But I no longer have the ability to implement an arbitrary filter at this location and a different arbitrary filter next to it, okay? So if I, if I look at all the spatial locations in a row in the scene, okay? So here, this is one row of the scene. I'm labeling the spatial locations A through H. And now on my mirror, the correspond, mirror array, the corresponding row, I'm going to label the mirrors one through whatever. Well, the filter that I'm implementing for location A might be the pattern of mirrors 1 through 128, and then the filter that I'm implementing for B comes from 2 through 129 and so on. So I get this correlation relationship. I get this, sort of this, this shift uh, structure. And so they're within a row, the filters are correlated, and so I don't get to design them independently anymore. Okay? So now I have to do a joint design process. I have to design the mirror pattern for a row to try and be as optimal as possible for all the spatial locations that exist in that row. So how are we going to do that? Well, if we have our PCA, and so, so this is the formula for the, the probabilistic PCA I showed you before, we can visualize this as something like this. And you, know, you probably can't see what's going on here, but I have a matrix. Here's the, the S1, the spectrum of compound 1 minus the average spectrum. And this is the square root of this probability. So when I do this multiplication, I, I pick up the, the right probability. And so I can think of loading these spectra into the rows and then multiplying by the, the, tr the transpose. Okay? And that gives me this thing that I will then want to take the first eigenvector of to get the first principal component. Well, I can do the same thing now. I, take, I do this for every location in a row. So for each location in a row, I have spec estimates of the probabilities for the different compounds. Okay? Uh, and so I load these in, except now f for the second one, I shift over one spectral channel. And so that's what gives me this, this relationship that's this shifting here, OK? And so I load these little sub-matrices into this big matrix, stepping over one time for each spatial location. Uh, and then I do the, the same sort of transpose and multiply. And that gives me this new higher dimensional matrix that I take the uh, uh, first eigenvector of. And that now gives me the mirror pattern that does the best at separating the compounds in contention at all the different locations in that row. Okay, so it tries to balance what's going on in all the rows. All right, so we built that. So here's, you know, it's, it's no longer this ideal 4F system as, as we go in and we start to optimize some stuff, but this is what it looks like. So the light comes in, in the back there's the DMD, and then for those of you who've worked with DMDs, you know there's issues about how the mirrors tilt and angles, and you have to make some unpleasant choices, and so the light goes radiating off in this crazy cockeyed uh, uh, dimension, uh, direction, and, and, you know, it's an annoying optimal mechanical problem. Um, and then we, so like I said, we, we had some, we used the DMD and we got some custom uh, gradings fabricated. All right, so I'm going to actually, this is actually experimental results. I'm going to show you a video. Um, each row is a different TSNR. So again, remind you, zero dB noise is as large as the minimum separation of the spectra we're trying to tell apart. Minus 3 dB, it's bigger. Minus 6, the noise is even bigger. Over here, I'm going to show you the code that we derive via this joint PPCA to put on the mirrors. Here, you're going to see the detector output 
what we measure, and then here is the result of our classification decision. Okay? Now, we're just trying to decide between four different spectra at this point, and our system is set up so that it's 64 by 64 spatial locations, 34, 38 spectral channels. Okay? And then to get, we're, we're, we're actually running at this TSNR, and we're actually just corrupting the measurements to work at these other uh, TSNRs. And so what you can see as it runs is that very quickly, after only a few measurements, we've actually classified every single one of these uh, uh, locations correctly, uh, 4,000 locations, um, after only a few measurements. Uh, at this TSNR, I think we've also achieved perfect classification of all the locations. And then you see there's some significant uh, misclassifications, but still overall pretty good by the t uh, for this, this worst TSNR. And so we, can, we do this experiment, we do it at different um, TSNR values, and we can compare with the simulation we've built. So here, the, the same, it's the same general problem. Um, again, we're corrupting the TSNR, uh, or corrupting the measurements to get different TSNRs. The dots represent uh, experimental runs. The solid curves are simulation results. Um, and overall, this, it was very hard to get this level of agreement. And this is actually really good agreement. You'll notice there's four or orders of magnitude in classification error rate here. And we're going over basically one order of magnitude in classification difficulty. Okay? And, so, and down here, basically right here, is no errors. Okay, so there's, there's 4,000 spatial locations, so you know, this is about 2.5, I guess, uh, times 10 to the minus 4 is, uh, is zero, zero errors. Um, uh, anyway, achieving that level of agreement was, was very, very difficult, uh, and I'm, I'm going to say more about that later. Okay? Does the behavior make sense? So this is a slightly different simulation, but it, it's the same structure. We, we get these curves at the beginning, and then they transition to sort of this, this linear stuff. Okay? So, so is that what we should expect? Well, uh, um, notice it's a semi-log plot. So straight lines on a semi-log plot is exponential. So we're, we're seeing exponential decay of the error rate. Okay? Well, it turns out that there's all kinds of exponential error theorems that predict theoretically that when you are in a two-class decision problem, your error should be reducing exponentially. And we can actually extract slopes and we can show qualitative agreement with these error theorems. And what this is actually showing us is something very interesting. It says when we reach the straight line, we've basically rejected all but two of the compounds in the library. And at this point, we're just deciding more and more accurately between these final two, okay, that w which almost invariably are the true thing and, the, and whichever other compound in the particular case happens to be closest to it. Okay? And so we're just, we're just riding that exponential down as we accumulate more photons. We're operating essentially nearly at the theoretical limit of how fast we should be able to decrease our error. Okay? So, okay, so it makes sense, the, 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 the qualitative behavior and even the, you know, maybe even semi-quantitatively, uh, the slopes make sense. Um, so now what we want to do, though, is I've just shown you how it compares to itself on problems of different complexity or different classification difficulty. What we'd like to do is we'd like to compare to traditional systems. But now we run into this problem that our classification is ranked based on TSNR, how hard the classification problem is, and we tend to think about conventional systems in terms of SNR, okay, actually this, the, you know, the, the number of photons collected versus the noise that we have. So we need to find some way to put them on equal footing. And so, first of all, in both cases, what we're going to do is we're going to make decisions based on MAP, maximum a posteriori, which all that means is at each time step, we're going to look, and at each location, we're going to say which compound has the highest probability based on the measurements we've made, and that's going to be our classification decision. Not a crazy thing to do. Now, the traditional methods of spectral imaging, followed by post-processing, they're all scanning based. The spectral data cube is three-dimensional. Sensor arrays are two-dimensional. So you've got to scan over at least one dimension. And in order to be able to, with, with this, with the filters, we can make a, a classification decision. May not be a good one, but we can make a classification decision after one measurement. Okay? I project onto a filter, and something's going to have the highest probability. Okay? The conventional system, I actually have to have measured the entire cube at that point, okay? which means I have to scan very fast, which means I, I pay an SNR penalty to work in the traditional instrument. The other way of saying it is the feature-based measurement is multiplexed. 
the conventional measurement is not. Okay, and so there's an SNR penalty that you end up paying based on the number of steps in the scan. If we imagine a spectral data cube that has M by M spatial dimensions and L spectral dimensions, then the penalty you're paying is a factor of L if you're sweeping over wavelength and doing a tunable filter system, a factor of M if you're doing a push broom system, and a whisk broom system scans in two spatial dimensions, so you're paying a crazy penalty of M squared. Okay, and so then how do we connect the TSNR and SNR? Well, we cut we say, okay, well, I'm running at this uh, TSNR, and I'm going to just say that my noise is one. That tells me what, how separated my library should be for that TSNR, okay? And then I can penalize that now scaled library by the appropriate amount to, to deal with the SNR penalty of needing to scan, okay? So in the end, this is how we be fair, this is how we're fair to all the instruments, okay? It, it's an apples to apples, okay? And so with that, now we can do this. So it's again classification error rate as a function of the amount of time I'm willing to spend. I'm, it's a four class problem, same size, I'm running at zero dB TSNR. Noise is as big as the minimum separation in my library. The blue curve here, is this FCC, the Adaptive Feature Specific Spectral Image Classifier, so what I've been talking about. These are the conventional instruments up here. Um, whisk broom, which is paying the M squared. Push broom, which is paying factor of M. And tunable filter, which is paying a factor of L. Okay, and then I can also think of the FCC not designing features and just run random features, okay? If I do that, I get this curve. And so, number one, we see the adaptive system is doing amazingly better than the conventional systems uh, in terms of error rate as, as a function of time. And this illuminates how much of that we're gaining from multiplexing, avoiding the SNR penalty, and how much we gain from adaptivity. So going from he these curves to this curve, that's multiplexing, because the random code is multiplexed. Going from this curve to this curve is adaptivity. That's how much you're paying, that's how much you're winning by being smart, instead of just making random codes, okay? And so you can see, you know, it, it looks like this is biggest, but if you think about this in a, in a vertical domain, right, it's from here to here is multiplexing, from here to here is, is adaptivity. And so we can just, if we choose as our baseline when the adaptive system uh, achieves essentially no errors, then we see we are, tw at the same amount of time, we have a 2500x improvement in the error rate over a random coded system and a 7500x improvement over the conventional systems because they're essentially indistinguishable at that point. At that few measurements, the conventional systems are still just randomly guessing uh, at what compound they're looking at. So the improvement arises from adaptivity uh, and multiplexing, uh, but it's really the adaptivity that ends up being the biggest winner. Now, this is another way of visualizing what's going on, uh, the difference between um, uh, adaptivity uh, and random. So I'm going to show you four movies. All right? The top are the designed features, so joint PPCA. The bottom is going to be random, so this is just multiplexed but not designed, and at two different TSNR levels, 0 dB and minus 10 dB. This is a much different problem. There's 20 classes now, 20 different compounds. Um, it's a much bigger 256 by 256 by 128. Um, and what we've done is we've actually taken data of Moffett Field in California. Um, and so you're going to, at each pixel, it's green if the system has correctly classified what's there. It's red if it's not. And further, if it's the frame where it correctly, has cla cl correctly classifies it and never misclassifies again, you'll get a bright green flash. Okay? And so actually what we see is a large portion of the scene is correctly classified on the first measurement and is never misclassified again uh, using the design features at 0 dB. But if, as I run it, you can see, and sorry, the contrast is a little poor, but what I want you to notice is that this one and this one are about the same. What we end up finding is design is worth about 8 dB in classification difficulty, okay? And so you, it's a huge improvement by using design over, over random. Um, the other thing that's, that's uh, perhaps interesting, now that you're starting to think about that maybe this thing being done aerially, is I've done the simulation for a staring platform, but everything we're doing is d being done on a row-by-row -row basis. So there's no reason this can't be on a moving platform and have the information handed off as the scene rolls by underneath, okay? And so there's no reason 
that it doesn't need to be, you know, uh, uh, other than just, just sort of basic stabilization, it doesn't have to be a staring sensor. We can continue to allow information to accumulate over time as the, as the platform is moving. Okay, um, so that's, that's the FCC, so that's classification spectral imaging. So the, the thing that we turned to most recently is thinking about what can we do. We've got this hardware. It's been very successful at direct classification. Can we use these, this hardware and can we design approaches for other spectral tasks? And so what we've turned to now is starting to look at spectral unmixing. Okay, so spectral and mixing, um, it, it's reasonable to assume that when you, when you have uh, uh, a spectrum that you measure, that it's, it's actually a mixture of several component spectra. If, if for no other reason in the real world, that if you have this thing on, say, a platform that's up in the air, the spatial resolution on the ground is going to be rather large and it's going to mix in multiple materials. So your return that you're measuring is going to really be a combination of the spectral behavior of everything that's in that resolution element. Um, and it's reasonable to, to assume that those kind of mix linearly. And so the spectral and mixing task is imagine that I have some spectrum R, which is some weighted combination, linear combination of, of baseline spectra, S1 through Sn, Esti what, estimating the fractional abundances, how much of each is in my spectrum. And so the question is, can we use this hardware, which was designed for classification, direct classification, for this other thing? Now, the other thing that we know is that in a natural scene, sp spectra are tip is the mixture is, is really, usually only involves a small number of compounds, right? If we think about all the different spectra that might be present, in general, we're going to get a mixture of a small number, and we say that that's sparse. And so we can start to think about the problem by, by solving it, not only doing data agreement, so that's what this term is, how, how close does our estimate of the, of the uh, fractional abundances match the data we saw, but also a regularization, a penalty term, which is forcing us towards sparse solutions, solutions that only include a few of the compounds in our library, mixed spectrum, library, only a few non-zero compound, uh, non-zero fractional abundances, okay? So we, can, we started simulating this. Now this is for a single location. This is not the spectral imager anymore. Um, and we, but, but imagining the kinds of things we can do with the FCC hardware. Um, and it's a 40 spectral channel thing. And so what we see is if we just measure the spectrum conventionally and then try and do the estimation of the fractional abundances versus doing it with uh, filters. Now, this is just multiplexing here. We're not doing design yet. Okay, we get this improve this reduction in the RMSE of our estimates. Okay, as a function of of S and R. Okay, uh, and this gap is exactly what you would expect for the multiplexing amount that we have. And then we see that if we instead instead of using like least squares, we use a sparsity promoting uh, estimator like Lasso. We see a further improvement. Uh, in our RMSE, uh, and in fact, the improvement is greatest at low SNR, which is also a good good problem to have. Now, what I'm showing you, none, none of this is adaptive, so that we, we don't yet have a framework where we design these filters, right? Once we have a framework where we can design the filters, then we can start doing adaptivity, but for now, it's just random multiplexing feature, random multiplex features, okay? Um, and remember, you know, the, the bullet point from last time was that the biggest win in classification was from adaptivity, so we expect that this will improve dramatically once we start having an adaptive framework. All right. So now we want to at least try this out. Um, and, and I actually didn't talk about this before in the classification, but one of the real challenges, especially with working with spectral imaging, uh, is having reliable ground truth. Um, when you're trying to... It, so if I was just building a spectral imager, I could, take, I could estimate the spectral data cube, and I could say, look, the things that are red are red. This seems reasonable, right? For classification, I'm trying to say this is what's there, right? And in general, there aren't very good data sets or scenes where people have gone through and specifically classified locations. So ground truth is very hard to come by. In the spectral imaging case, we ended up using an LED monitor. Uh, and so we could create our own libraries, identify you know, uh, particular RGB mixtures that were the different elements in our library, and we could control them and we could have perfect control over what the system was seeing. So we have a, face a similar problem here, but it, one display only gives us three N members, right? R, G, and B. 
So our solution was to come up with a system and, and mix two different displays with different technology, LED and OLED, uh, and they have different RGB spectra, and we combine them in a way so that now we can present to the instrument a scene, and at each location we can have a mixture of these six different spectra. It's still not great, I would love to have way more than six, okay? But this is, it's very, very hard to have something where you have independent control of spectral content at each spatial location in the scene. The, the, those kinds of calibration sources in general don't exist. So this is, so this is tough. Um, and so we're gonna, we're gonna superpose that, feed, feed this into the instrument, um, and we're gonna start very simple, 32 by 32 spatial pixels and 38 spectral channels. Okay, now we need a toy problem to investigate. Again, this is early days of this stuff. We're just trying to figure out how to start doing this. And so the idea is we're going to, on the monitor, we're going to have just green, and we're going to ramp in brightness from one side to the other. And on the OLED, we're going to have green, and we're going to ramp in brightness from the, from, from in the other direction. And so every pixel in the data cube is a mixture of the two greens, and the two fractional abundances should sum to one. So this is about as simple a system that has, that has structure as you can think of, but it's where we want it to start, okay? Now, I'm going to show you the experimental results. Now, remember, at each location, now I'm estimating six fractional abundances. I can't show you six numbers at a time at each spatial location, so I'm breaking them out into the monitor fractional abundances and the OLED fractional abundances, okay? But for each picture in this, each pixel in the scene, there's six numbers, and I'm going to plot three of them here as RGB and three of them here. But so it's going to, you're going to see two pictures at once, but remember what's actually going to the system is, is just, you know, it's just getting one window. They've been overlapped, okay? And to remind you, up above is what the true answer is. And so as we run it, you see, we start out with red, green, and blue all kind of mixed, but over time, the system figures out, yes, it's seen green, and, you know, we're getting there. It's seeing that there's this ramp. It's not perfect, okay, but it's definitely starting to get the structure of, of how the fractional abundances are changing over the scene. And we, then we can pick, we can look at a particular pixels. So if we look at a pixel in the middle of the scene, so this is fractional abundance as a function of measurement number and the different red, green, and blue, and then the solid lines are ground truth. In the middle, that basically we should have 0.5 of monitor green and 0.5 of OLED green. And indeed, after about five measurements, our estimates converge on that value and stay there. And very quickly, the red and blue go to zero and stay there. But if we look at the edge of the field, while we eventually get there, now over on the edge, remember we have ramps, so this particular pixel, the truth, was about uh, 0.32 of uh, OLED green and about 0.68 of monitor green. We eventually get pretty close to the true answer, but it takes us a lot longer to get there, and you see the red and the blue hang around for, for longer. It um, takes about 25 measurements before we get there. Now, again, this is, you know, early days of, of our explorations in this, but uh, we sort of attribute this fact to residual calibration errors. And I, I alluded earlier that calibration uh, is, is a challenge in, in all of this stuff. For one case, because, as I said, there's not really good calibration sources. There's not really good controllable sources in this case. But I, I think it goes, I think it's deeper than that. Um, and that is that redundancy and reliability often go together. So, right, and so NASA's motto in 1960s, you know, failure's not an option, so they made everything triply redundant. Those of us in the compressive sensitive community say, well, natural signals are really redundant, and boy, that's a waste of resources. Let's get rid of that. So as a result, the, the benefits we get in these kinds of compressive and computational measurements tend to make the system more brittle at least as, as the, 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 the field is currently defined. Um, and, and so you, you end up becoming incredibly sensitive to how well you know the details of the measurements you're making. And so calibration becomes just dramatically more important than in conventional systems. And so especially when you don't have good calibration sources, that becomes a really tough tough problem. Okay? And, and you know, the errors can come either because you can't build anything perfect, Right? There's, there's always this. But, but also, you know, over time, systems drift, right? Those of you who are, you know, doing, doing research, you, you know you periodically have to go in and realign things no matter, no, you know, no matter what your, your best intentions. Uh, or, you know, God, God forbid somebody drops a wrench on the table and all your mirror mounts move. And, and you know, so you, it can be over time or it can be very, very sudden. Um, and, and so I think this is, you know, this is a bigger, um, 
this is a bigger issue that I, I think the field is going to have to to work at. Um, anyway, so just to wrap up, um, you know, over over the years now in my group, uh, in this general area, we've we've looked at adaptive spectral processing of, of different types, uh, we've, for spectroscopy and spectral imaging. Uh, in general, we see one, two, three orders of magnitude improvement in performance uh, when we let the system directly try and answer the questions that we care about rather than capturing the, measure, the, 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 the measurements traditionally and then do post-processing. Uh, and the adaptivity tends to be a big part of the win even over random and other types of multiplex methods. Um, in the spectral imaging case, we've developed a, a feature design procedure. Um, I didn't talk about this information optimal. We also derived what's the information optimal measurements to make uh, with uh, Professor Ashok's help. Uh, and we showed that this ad hoc PCA one works almost as well as the information optimal approach. Uh, and boy, is it a lot easier computationally. Um, we've, we've just started turning to this spectral and mixing problem. We've, we've demonstrated that it, it can be done with this hardware. But like I said, right now, we're just using random multiplexing. Uh, and the winds that we saw before lead us to believe that really it's the adaptivity that is, is really where, where the money's going to be. So we're trying to develop design approaches so that this adaptivity can then be included. Uh, and again, as I've harped on a couple times now, the most difficult piece in almost all of them was figuring out how to calibrate the dang thing. Um, and, and I think this remains a largely unaddressed fundamental challenge uh, in this type of computational and compressive sensing. Uh, I and others in the field are arguing arguing that to our colleagues and, and trying to find ways uh, uh, just to resolve that problem. And we've made some initial efforts along this front. Uh, and with that, I think I will end. And uh, thank you for your attention. Thanks. Thanks, Mike, for that great talk.